Hello, welcome to Converging Dialogues. This is Xavier Bonilla. Okay, this episode is terribly important for our current age. Unfortunately, it's important that we still have to talk about this. Uh, today, I'm speaking with Carl Robichon. Carl is uh, the Nuclear Weapons Policy Program Officer and co-leads uh, Longview uh, Philanthropies uh, Program on Nuclear Weapons Policy. He's also previously worked with the Century Foundation, Global Security Institute, uh, where there's extensive research there that he's done on um, arms control, international security policy, and non-proliferation. Background, he has a master's in public policy and international affairs from Princeton University. He's also on the Council on Foreign Relations. And we talk all about nuclear weapons and nuclear weapons policy. And we start by, by talking about why this is still important to talk about, why this is relevant, why this is an important issue. Um, I think after, quote unquote, the Cold War ended, we kind of forgot about nuclear weapons. They're still out there. There are still countries that have them. And it is still any time two countries are in conflict and one of those countries has a uh, nuclear weapon, is always on the table. It's always a what if, and it's, it immediately comes back into the conversation. And that's a scary thing. Um, and it's also a scary thing when two countries are in conflict that both have nuclear weapons or allies have nuclear weapons. So it is, uh, it's, uh, it's grim out there, especially since there are many conflicts going on in the world right now uh, with countries that do have nuclear weapons um, and other countries uh, in surrounding areas that also have nuclear weapons. So. Um, it's kind of a mess and, um, lots to be worried about. We start by talking about why this is still relevant, why this is still a risk, why we should be, uh, thinking about this and concerned about it. There's obviously many things to worry about in the world, um, in terms of humanitarian issues, in terms of climate change, in terms of, uh, economics, etc. And many times we forget about this, but this is definitely uh, top five, if not top three uh, issues. We start all the way at the beginning. We obviously talk about Oppenheimer, the creation of the bomb, uh, how it was tried to um, be regulated after Hiroshima and, and Nagasaki. Uh, we talk about what Oppenheimer did after uh, the two uh, bombs were dropped and how he was an advocate for non-proliferation. We talk about the Bay of Pigs, how close we were to nuclear war. I mean, super close. Uh, so we talk about that. We talk about uh, SALT 1 and 2, START 1 and 2. We talk about the nuclear arms race during the Cold War. We talk about the current nine countries that have nuclear weapons and what that means. We talk about the development of a nuclear taboo and how some countries have chosen to do away with their nuclear weapons entirely because of this kind of taboo that's kind of a sort of global taboo of let's not have nuclear weapons. We talk about the India-Pakistan uh, tensions with nuclear weapons. We obviously talk about Iran and the nuclear weapons uh, deal that Obama made and some of the uh, ins and outs of that and some of the criticism. We talk a little bit about nuclear energy. Uh, we talk about Russia-Ukraine conflict. Uh, at the time of recording this, um, I, th I believe the Israel conflict had just uh, started, um, the more recent one, and so we talk a little bit about about that. And you know, both these, you know, both you know, Israel has obviously nuclear weapons. Um, China and, and their nuclear weapons. Will the United States resume testing soon of our nuclear weapons? We talk about hypersonic missiles. The process of the United States launching a nuclear weapon, just how uh, easy, unfortunately, that is to do in some ways. We talk about, obviously, AI, how that could or could not be used with nuclear weapons. And we end with, what does a healthy future look like with no nuclear weapons? Um, and, you know, there's, <laughs> as we mentioned in the conversation, there's, uh, there's a lot of, it's a lot of grim facts, um, but I was really uh, 
proud of this conversation. I think it's important for us to focus sharply our attention on this in ways in which we can um, try to, at the very least, be educated on it and in some ways uh, behooving others to, to say, hey, listen, we, we shouldn't have nuclear weapons. Um, so tense times is a tough subject, but I think a very important one, and Carl is, is doing absolutely uh, great work at uh, Longview Philanthropy. Uh, as always, you can find this conversation and all other conversations at convergingdialogues.substack.com. So get over there, follow, like, subscribe. Obviously, you can contribute if you so feel. Uh, much appreciated for that. You can also find me on YouTube. Uh, support Carl and his work at Longview. Uh, doing great stuff. And uh, now I bring you Carl Robichon. I am here with Carl Robichar. Uh, Carl, uh, how's it going? Thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Yeah, pleasure to be here. I, I, um, I really like the work you're doing. Uh, thanks so much. Yeah, uh, well, I, I really like the work that you're doing, and um, I'm I'm very excited to talk with you about uh, a tough subject, but a subject that is all too relevant, unfortunately. So your work is you're you're not going to be out of a job anytime soon. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, before we get into all the topics. Um, why don't you just tell listeners just a kind of brief snapshot of, uh, you know, where you work currently and, you know, who you are kind of professionally and academically. Yeah. So I am now at Longview Philanthropy. We advise high net individuals on their philanthropic giving and especially focused on global catastrophic risks. Before that, I was for 12 years at Carnegie Corporation of New York, where I led our nuclear weapons policy grant making there and have worked at a few different think tanks and research institutes as well. But most of my career, I've been focused on how do we turn money into better policy and how do we get that money in the hands of academics, researchers, analysts, and advocates to try to get better outcomes in the real world. Yeah, that's, that's again very, very necessary. And uh, you, you won't be out of a job anytime soon. <laughs> so a lot of your work is on uh, nuclear weapons, right? Mm -hmm. That's my And, and uh, so again, much, much to talk about here, much to get into. I, I, when I was preparing for the conversation, I was thinking about what angle I wanted to, to uh, tackle this from. So I think what might be helpful to start is, and you can kind of go anywhere you want with this, but uh, currently, so we're recording this October of 2023. Um, what is the current kind of overall landscape of nuclear weapons, non-proliferation, uh, various tensions, uh, policies that are trying to uh, mediate those, which, which kind of give us the 30,000 foot view of this? Yeah, it's been changing pretty quickly. And for the past 30 years, nuclear weapons. We've been, you know, a lot of people believed we were moving towards a world of fewer nuclear weapons and lower nuclear risk. And in fact, the trend lines were pretty encouraging. And today we are once again headed in the wrong direction. Um, you've seen Russia's nuclear threats in Ukraine. Yeah. We can see China seems to be prepared to triple the size of their nuclear arsenal. You have North Korea that continues to make threats and test missiles and nuclear devices. They've, got, they've gone from two nuclear weapons to about 20 today, and they continue to improve their arsenal. You, know, you still have India and Pakistan in the background. Both of those countries are upgrading their nuclear arsenals. And what we've seen in the past few weeks is new activity at the nuclear test sites of the United States, of Russia, and of China. It could, it's quite possible that Russia could pull out of its moratorium on nuclear testing and test nuclear weapons again for the first time, you know, be the first test by a major power in decades. And that would be a really troubling development. So, yeah, we've had this period of relative calm, and a lot of people have assumed that this issue was not something they needed to be concerned about. And I'm sorry to say, it's not just an issue of the past. And we need to continue to 
think about nuclear weapons and work to reduce these risks because right now the trend lines are headed in the wrong direction. I mean, don't we have enough problems in the world? We have you know, <laughs> I, issues with climate yeah. change and we have, you know, authoritarians and we have, you know, all these issues yeah. and now we got to we got one we thought was kind of trying yeah, to be put like to bed. Yeah, this was like the Cold War problem. This was the yeah, one that we thought right. we put behind us. And <laughs> right. Yeah, I'm like I'm the I'm a fun guy to talk to at parties because everybody leaves. Oh, I'll let, no, just <laughs> thanks, Carl. Another thing I got to worry about. <laughs> Another thing I got to worry about. Right. <laughs> okay. Well, so there's you listed a bunch of the countries that I, I wanted to discuss yeah. in terms and of. Yeah, we can you know, get into more detail and, on any of those if you're interested at some point. Yeah. 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 So let's start at the beginning. So. Um, I think uh, a handful of people around the world have seen the Oppenheimer film. Uh, hopefully, <laughs> Just, it's about to cross a billion dollars in, uh, yeah. in revenue. It's, yeah. it's a it's Big it's land. pretty fantastic that uh, a three hour movie yeah. in half of it black and white that's pretty much ninety percent dialogue is uh, made so much money. So it's it's, it's yeah. quite an astounding achievement yeah. in terms of filmmaking. Yeah, I mean, people will see big films if they're done right and they're marketed First? right and. Yeah, yeah. I thought it was yeah. I I saw it three or four times myself in you the did. theater in different formats. Yeah, wow. it was it was it was quite the quite the spectacle. It's very well done. Um, the book, which it's based off of, uh, is written by Marty Sherman and Kai Bird. And I talked to Kai Bird about the book uh, on the podcast. Um, actually, it was earlier this year, and then I released it around when the film came out. So. I have a kind of historical lens, a yeah. biographical lens from Kai. Kai wrote a, you know, both of them wrote a fantastic, uh, you know, Pulitzer Prize winning uh, biography. It's great. Yeah. And Kai's so good at explaining stuff in history. He's, he's just got a really nice nature about him. So listeners yeah. can listen to that conversation if they like for kind of the, the history. And I think Kai really got the, like he, he kind of got Oppenheimer, like what made him tick and the brevity of it and why he's probably the most important person uh, in our lifetimes and probably many lifetimes, to be honest. Um, he, is, he is super important. So there's a historical lens. What I want to ask you about is more on the, I guess you could say the policy end of things, but kind of what happened, the afters, right? Yeah. So yeah, was nuclear weapons, I mean, the way kind of the book says and the film says, and I'm sure other uh, books have been written on this, but this just seemed kind of inevitable. Mm. Like it was going to happen. The Germans Mm. were going to do it. The Russians were going to do it. Somebody was going to do it. They were going to figure out uh, nuclear fission. They were going to figure out how to do this. And so, you know, maybe in a way, uh, you know, there's some way in which it had to kind of be figured out. Obviously it's horrendous what happened in in, uh, Nagasaki and Hiroshima, but I guess, yeah, was it inevitable? And what does that time frame of the thirties and forties tell us about developing technology that could be really harmful for us? Yeah. If we live in a world in which the laws of physics permit nuclear fusion and nuclear fission and allow us to bring that, power to earth, right? And to develop these incredibly powerful weapons. So as long as the laws of physics permit that, it was a matter of time until people unlocked that. And so I think at some level, the the use of nuclear technology is inevitable. I think the circumstances by which it came into the world are highly contingent, right? Mm. And It's one of the great ironies that this weapon that was used by the United States as this victorious power to end the war was actually brought, you know, the the impetus was Nazi Germany. They were Mm -hmm. the country that started the race to the bomb. And I think we would view the weapon very differently if it was introduced by Nazi Germany rather than as part of this arsenal of democracy, right? And I don't think it's at all inevitable that the bomb arrived at the particular moment that it did in the particular historical circumstances that it did, right? So physics permits bombs, but they're not easy to engineer. And there was really only one country in the world that could put the kind of effort behind it 
during World War II, right? It, you know, it was $2 billion at the time. There were 120,000 people. Uh, 120,000 people worked on the Manhattan Project, right? So Oppenheimer, you see a slice of this at Los Alamos. You mm -hmm. see the scientists, but there were huge facilities in Tennessee and Washington mm -hmm. State that were producing the fissile material to go into this. And so that, that type of big project becomes possible when you're in a wartime footing. But mm. I don't know if someone proposed building nuclear bombs for the first time during peacetime, if mm -hmm. they would have been able to marshal the kind of resources and will that, that it took. So mm. it, it, it's a really interesting alternate history, right? Well, there's two alternate histories yeah. there. The one is, yeah, if, could this be done in the 20s? Yeah. Probably not. Right. 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 Um, hard to say in the 50s because it's obviously post war. But yeah, in the 20s, would this have been done? Probably not. But there's that, that fear when I, when, I, when I explain this to people as much as I know. It's like, look, like there were brilliant German scientists that were working hard on this. And, you know, Hitler was very close to, you know, completely taking over England. You know, if, if Hitler gets, uh, you know, a, a nuclear bomb made by, you know, German scientists that were working on it. And, you know, they almost, you know, get all the way up into England. You know, they can, they can point that nuclear bomb if they have it anywhere on the globe at that point. Yeah. And, you know, you know, history, we, we, you know, who knows what kind of history would be. I mean, the whole idea of the third Reich was a thousand year Reich. Right. I mean, that was the whole point. So you, you know, if people push, put themselves back in the thirties and forties, it was a race of, we have to deal with, we got to get there first. We got to build it. Now, whether you use it or not is a whole other, you know, issue, but at the least the fact that you're able to do it just in case, I mean, made a lot of sense. I think most people, if they place themselves in that yeah. context, would probably do it knowing what could happen, no? Right. If you feel like you have a powerful adversary that's developing this technology, you want to try to get there first, or at least to mm -hmm. ensure that they're not going to have a monopoly over it. Right. Mm -hmm. And this was like all these military technologies, right? Rockets, tanks, submarines. Um, you know, if the other side had them, you'd want to explore whether you could get them too. Now, something interesting happens, which is that the intelligence community and the science community realizes pretty quickly that Germany is on the wrong track. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know if they realize relatively quickly, but well before the final preparations are made for the Trinity test, they know that Germany is not going to get the bomb. Um, mm. You know, Japan also explored the bomb. They knew that Japan was not going to get the bomb. So at that point, there was really only one bomb program that was advanced to, to have any kind of um, role in World War II. Um, mm. And at that point, a lot of the Manhattan Project scientists said, why are we building this thing? Right? We built this to defeat Nazi Germany. Nazi Germany just surrendered. Right. Um, wh what are we going to do with this weapon? Um, should we not reconsider this? So this is depicted in the film where Niels Bohr comes to Oppenheimer and asks, is the bomb big enough? And right. Oppenheimer says, to end the war. And Bohr says, no, to end all wars. And that's a view that was prevalent along, among a lot of the scientists is that a, a weapon of this power, nobody could continue to fight wars under the shadow of a weapon like that. Mm -hmm. um, of course, we know now they were hopelessly naive on that particular point because we've had lots of wars in the shadow of nuclear weapons. Um, I think Albert Nobel, uh, who created dynamite, also believed that this would make wars unfightable, right? <laughs> and I, yes, my concern is that any technology you unleash into the world, people will find a way to, to continue to use it. Um, yeah, continue to use it. And then also to, you know, I think there's a, there's a scene in the film of, uh, I forget, he's talking with one of the scientists and, and it's like, you know, well, well what's after the nuclear yeah. bomb like what happens after that and i think that maybe not it's not necessarily worse but one of the things that um 
I think I've been more in my lifetime aware of is the use of chemical weapons. Yeah. Um, has been, I think it's a different type of warfare. Yeah. That's a different type of way of killing people as opposed to, you know, obviously a nuclear bomb decimates, you know, it can decimate a whole city obviously, but chemical warfare is, is an, is a whole other kind of evil. So, I mean, there's, there's, you know, there, yeah. again, there's, I mean, there's I always suppose, something. Like poison gas is really awful, but mm-hmm. so is radiation sickness. Right. right. And if yeah. You listen yeah. to the accounts of people dying slowly over the course of days is, mm. you know, they just, they waste away or mm. they, to die years later of leukemias and cancers. Mm-hmm. It's like mm-hmm. a really yeah. awful way to die. Yeah. It's terrible. It's terrible. But psychologically, physically, yeah. it's just the effects yeah. of it decades after is, 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 you know, absolutely grotesque. So, and I think that's like one of the questions that we've grappled with in the nuclear age is, Mm -hmm. is this just a bigger bomb? Is this a weapon of war that can be used like other weapons of war? Or is there something different? Is, Mm. does this cross a line? Yeah. And is it, is it disproportionate? Does it harm civilians? And that is where a lot of the big debate lies today. Uh, you know, mm. as countries are rebuilding their arsenals, I, they're thinking about these as weapons. But most citizens don't think about nuclear weapons just as weapons to be used on the battlefield, but as something inherently disproportionate, evil, like a mm. chemical weapon, or like a mm-hmm. biological mm-hmm. weapon. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's a it's it's a strange framing and how different people will see it differently. After yeah. Hiroshima and Nagasaki, I mean, obviously it, it changed the world in, in, in terrible ways, but how did a nuclear world begin to have new questions and try to develop policies yeah. and legislations and regulation of this? Uh, you can talk about the IAEA um, and how that continues to have a ripple effect today. But what was the kind of conversation in the late forties and then fifties and going into, into uh, yeah, probably the late fifties of what do we do with this? What's next? Yeah. What happens? We don't want this yeah. again. How did this t- turn out legislatively? So the scientists from the start knew that this was a scientific technology that was out there and that basically anyone could master it. And so they saw the need from the start for some types of controls because if every country could get these weapons, we would be living in a really scary world. And initially, a lot of those scientists were consulted closely. There were, you know, so yeah, after Nagasaki, there were actually no nuclear weapons in the world, right? Because that was the second and only bomb the U.S. had at that point, and it would be another month before another would come off the production line, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, Stalin knew that he wanted them. Uh, He had spies uh, in the Manhattan Project and in other places and understood uh, that this was a technology that he needed to counter in some way. But it would be four years before they would be able to build up the infrastructure. And a lot of people at the time thought it would be a lot longer. So Mm. there was a plan for international control of nuclear weapons that the U.S. proposed. It was initially this Atchison Lilienthal report, which was actually drafted by Oppenheimer. uh, Mm. And that became the Baruch plan. And Baruch was this elderly statesman, um, former financier, who went forward and tried to negotiate a deal with the Soviet Union and with other countries to try to limit the spread of nuclear weapons. And the US would have briefly a monopoly on nuclear technology, but they would then move towards a world with intrusive verification to ensure that no country could have this weapon. And Mm. that plan was essentially dead on arrival um, because, well, a few reasons. I mean, one thing, there was an incredible distrust between the United States and the Soviet Union. Um, Stalin wanted the bomb. He didn't want the U.S. to persist in its monopoly over this technology. He didn't trust the U.S. Um, Lots of other countries wanted nuclear weapons or technology as well. And there was no mechanism for the sorts of intrusive verification and monitoring that you would need. I mean, it's an interesting thought experiment to imagine. Like, let's say nuclear weapons were somehow invented in 2023 uh, in a world where we have satellite imagery and persistent 
um, camera surveillance of all different things? Could we establish a world with intrusive verification that would actually work? That's an interesting experiment to play out, mm -hmm. right? But mm -hmm. certainly at the time in 1945, this was not something that they could agree to. And so lots of countries started hedging and started developing their own nuclear programs in order to have a backup plan uh, if, if they needed to rely on nuclear weapons for their security. And it's interesting because the film Oppenheimer really focuses on his role at, at Los Alamos. But there's right. this incredibly rich history of his engagement after the war, which uh -huh. the film touches on, certainly. The book goes into a lot more detail on it. Yeah, and yeah. you know his role as a a voice for what he saw as this the, this open world in which nobody could keep secrets. How do we manage a world of competition and keep ourselves from blowing each other up? Right. Yeah, I would say probably his life is probably at least in four acts. Right. You know the beginning, yeah. and then you know how he's you know he tries to figure himself out and he does, and then. He gets to this space where he's, you know, leading the project and building the bomb and things like that. And then this third act of his life is basically twofold. At least my understanding is he kind of becomes a, uh, uh an advocate for, uh, nonproliferation. I mean, he's trying yeah. to say, like, listen, we can't make these things. Like we can't do this. Um, and he's, it seems like he's just trying to put everything back in the bag and he just can't, yeah. he can't do it. But he, he tried, he tried, he spent you know, years doing that all yeah. throughout the fifties. Um, while simultaneously dealing with the hearings and is he a communist and doing yeah. all of this stuff? Um, I think it's so strange because once he gets his, um, uh, privileges taken away or whatever it is, he, he kind of becomes a rec recluse. He goes yeah. and lives off in the in the Caribbean, I believe. Yeah. Uh, he just gets on an island and he doesn't really say anything. He doesn't really yeah. do a lot of interviews he too much. Pretty much vanishes from public and, life. Yeah. And then he ends up, uh, yeah. he died of, um, I think it was throat cancer. I yeah. could be wrong on that. But yeah, he, he, he ends up dying in his 60s. Yeah. So, so it's quite interesting how he did dedicate a lot of his life after yeah. that to trying to prevent it. I mean, yeah. as much as he probably humanly could. I don't think there's anything else he could have done. Yeah, I mean, he, that's why his political opponents wanted him sidelined, is mm -hmm. because he had this degree of fame and renown that allowed him to be an advocate for these types of arms control proposals. Uh, you know, he was a complicated person, and yeah. he often took one position and then took another position, right? And that, mm -hmm. I think, that, that reflects to me a certain nuance to his thinking. There's a there's mm -hmm. a film in the there's a scene in the film where Edward Teller says, You're like a sphinx. Nobody knows what you really believe. <laughs> and I think there's some truth to that. And um his his his, you know, was he against atomic bombs or was he only against certain types of atomic bombs? Mm -hmm. Well, he kind of allied himself with the army for a narrow vision of using atomic bombs, but not developing hydrogen bombs that could be used as these city busters. So that's the thing you have to, to realize to really understand what's going on in the film is mm -hmm. that these hydrogen bombs, which are tested just seven years after the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombs, are a thousand times more powerful and they can be made even more powerful still than, than those initial atomic bombs. Um, so uh, there, the, the difference in scale is almost as great as between a conventional bomb and an atomic bomb as between a atomic bomb and a thermonuclear or hydrogen bomb. Mm -hmm. And that allows you to miniaturize them. It allows you to put them on rockets. It allows you to develop, deliver them around the world in 30 minutes. And mm -hmm. one missile can destroy a whole city, right? Mm -hmm. So that is this fundamental transformation in the practice of war and in the practice of diplomacy that's going on in the backdrop of the movie. And I have one concern about the movie is I don't think it really drives home that part of the story and that part of Oppenheimer's life as well mm -hmm. as it could, but yeah, you know, I'll give, yeah, I'll give yeah. Christopher Nolan a pass, right? It's a three hour. Yeah, well, I mean, it was again, 90% dialogue. So any yeah. more dialogue, I think, and any longer, I think people <laughs> probably couldn't get through it. Yeah. Um, so obviously we we see all this this stuff going on during the fifties, but we we finally we get to the the Cuban Missile Crisis, and 
I mean, I've read a little bit about this and yeah. more recently, and I mean, we were really fucking close. Yeah. I mean, can can you can you just paint a picture of how close we were? I mean, again, ninety yeah. miles from Florida. Yeah, you know, and and so what we can kind of illustrate here is, uh, at least during the sixties, maybe it's, maybe it's changed now. I'm not sure, but what was at the time the process of pushing the button um right and and what that was like but just tell us how close we actually were in that in that space yeah we were really close and one of the scary things when you read the history now is you realize that the principals who are making the decisions didn't even know how close we were and many of them died not knowing how close we were because it was only revealed later when we got the declassified information mm-hmm. and got all the documents from the former Soviet Union, right? So as scary as it was for Kennedy and Khrushchev in the moment, there were actually a couple other incidents that could have led to widespread nuclear war. Now, just mm-hmm. for context, by the time you have this crisis, um, they, there are there's, there's the equivalent of 1.4 million Hiroshima bombs in the U.S. stockpile alone, right? Mm. Is the weapons? There's so many more of them. They're more powerful, and the plan was to use them not only against the Soviet Union but against Soviet allies in Eastern Europe and in China in order to create a a, a sort of a, a path to the targets that they needed to hit. So, if deterrence had failed, this would have been massive consequences, mm. right? Um, And you have this standoff. It's about the placement of these long-range missiles in Cuba by the Soviet Union to protect its ally in in Cuba and to prevent another invasion. So the U.S. had attempted this Bay Bay of Pigs overthrow of the Castro government and had failed. And so the Soviet Union, figuring that they never wanted to see that happen again, was going to place these missiles. uh, And they would be able to hit Washington, D.C. in the course of minutes, right? Mm. And that was unacceptable. And initially, Kennedy's advisors said, we've got to go in and take these out. And many of them actually viewed this as an opportunity to resolve the Cuba situation for once and all. And were prepared to go in with, with airstrikes followed by an invasion. And Kennedy, because he had been burned by the Cuban Missile Crisis, which was an Eisenhower era plan that he inherited. He was never really sure about it. He went ahead with it and it became this massive embarrassment, right? So he had a willingness to question some of the advice that was coming to him. Mm -hmm. And because of that, he said, well, hold on a second. What are our other options? And he was always asking, what is Khrushchev thinking? What is the Soviet Union thinking? Why would they do this? Right? And Because of that, they didn't go in immediately with an attack, but they instead put forward this quarantine. But that was a risky option too, right? Mm -hmm. So you're basically creating this embargo around the island of Cuba, and you've got to decide, are you going to be stopping these naval vessels that are coming in to resupply Cuba? And if you do, could that lead to war there? Meanwhile, they're flying surveillance flights, low-flying aircraft and high-flying aircraft to try to take photographs of the situation to understand how close these missiles are to operational. And the air defenses in Cuba are shooting at these. So you know, he issues an ultimatum. If one more of these planes gets shot down, we launch airstrikes, right? And the next day, another one gets shot down. And he's got to decide, do I... I've I've created this red line. Do we launch the attack? He said, actually, no, we're going to wait in part. And he was right because that, uh, the authority to launch that was not given by, uh, it was not given by Khrushchev. It was just a local commander on the ground who through their action, firing an anti-aircraft missile could have started nuclear war, right? Um, What we know now- That's so wild to think about, my goodness. Yeah. Um, and there's a few instances like this, right? So there's a, during the midst of the crisis, it's sort of almost unrelated, a, a, a U-2 plane, one of these high-flying surveillance planes, um, gets lost and starts to fly into Soviet airspace uh, up, by, up by Siberia, right? Uh, and it gets intercepted, right? So this is another instance of a, an unrelated 
action that, um, ex, you bad know, timing. accentuated this. That, yeah, bad timing. <laughs> it's the right? worst timing ever to get lost. Yeah. <laughs> and is and, it, don't people sometimes make this claim that, like, Kennedy really didn't know? Like you said, he inherited yeah. this from the Eisenhower administration. There was a lot of other principles that were in play. He, he really wasn't close to this. He didn't know, you know, people kind of say like, you know, oh, this, this whole, this whole period. But I think it's fair to say, I don't, I'm not sure how historians look at it now, but yeah. to say like, he, he really doesn't, shouldn't get the blame for this. I mean, at the end of the day, Wait, you're the what? president, blah, blah, blah. But yeah, the, the, he shouldn't get the blame for what specifically? For Bay of that, Pigs? That they were in that, yeah, for Bay of Pigs and that they were in this situation to begin with, right? Where it's this very yeah. close call kind of thing. I mean, it, he, yeah. he really was not as informed. Yeah. So the plan, yeah, he inherited the Bay of Pig, the Bay of Pigs plan um, from, from Eisenhower, but he went through with it, right? Like ultimately it's his call as president, mm-hmm. right? And the Cuban Missile Crisis, I see as being precipitated by this gamble by Khrushchev. Right. Mm. Um, so I think he's the main instigator of the crisis. But from his perspective, from Khrushchev's perspective, they weren't doing anything different than what the U.S. was doing to them. Mm. Right. Because we know that there were U.S. nuclear missiles that had been placed in Turkey, for example, mm. and at other uh, NATO bases in Europe. Mm. There were some in Italy, et cetera. You know, the similar type of missile that could strike Moscow in a short time of flight. Mm-hmm. So, you know, here's a case of misunderstanding. Khrushchev didn't realize how provocative it would be for them to put the missiles there. They mm-hmm. tried to sneak them in. They got caught. Now they were in a crisis of their own creation. Um, and both sides realized like, okay, we're in a really dangerous situation, but how do we back off without losing face? without mm-hmm. seeming weak to our allies, right? Mm-hmm. So Kennedy didn't want to seem weak to the NATO allies. Khrushchev didn't want to seem weak to Cuba and to the other countries that might come to rely on Soviet protection. So mm-hmm. neither side wanted to go to nuclear war over this, but they were caught in this trap of their own, uh, own creation in which they had to, you know, they were trying to stare each other down and try to get the best out of this situation. And, you know, after the, after the Cuban Missile Crisis, it, you know, ultimately it resolves, and I could tell you a couple other close calls along the way, but ultimately it resolves with Khrushchev pulling those missiles out mm. of Cuba. Mm. And for the next 30 years, that's what everyone thinks happened, right? Mm. Is that the Soviet Union blinked. Mm. But what we know is that those missiles were traded off in a secret deal uh, and that the missiles were removed from Turkey as well. So it's not Khrushchev that blinked. It's both Kennedy and Khrushchev who both blinked, right? Mm. And because of that, we didn't have a war in Cuba. We didn't have a nuclear war. Mm. Um, And that's a really important insight, but that wasn't the insight that they took away from the crisis, right? Mm. From the U.S. perspective, the lesson everyone took away, you, you, you got you to stare them down. You've got to be tougher than them. You can't blink, and the other side will concede. And within the Soviet Union, the lesson they took away was that we need more nuclear weapons because it was this gap in our capabilities that allowed us to get bullied by the U.S. when all the chips were on the table. Those, those are two very different stories. Those are two, yeah. <laughs> two very different takeaways. Yeah. And so, my, so, my view is like these weapons, they are weapons of war, but they also represent this shared challenge that we need mm-hmm. to work together. It, you know, the fact that nuclear physics permits these weapons of extraordinary power, that's a challenge that can only be resolved through cooperation, right? Mm-hmm. Um, because we can't ensure our own security just by having more weapons. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, and, this is the whole arms race thing, right? We don't want yeah. to continue to 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 push for that, right? Right. But you know, the the Cuban Missile Crisis wasn't the end of the arms race, especially on the Soviet mm-hmm. side. They continued to build up weapons and capabilities for many years, to the point where, you know, we had 
by the you know by the 1980s we had 60,000 60,000 mm. nuclear weapons mm. um mm. and you give a sense like uh some of those were tactical nuclear weapons but for the strategic ones essentially one weapon equates to the destruction of one city mm. Mm. that's that's that is not okay <laughs> that, is not, that is not okay at all so how so, did we get there right how did people think this was okay like even at the time they didn't really think it was okay but they felt that was really their only option and you had these very powerful bureaucracies that were uh, you know were put because the soviets were developing more mm -hmm. missiles that created more targets and the yeah. u.s needed more missiles to hit those targets but then mm -hmm. the soviets saw the u.s building those missiles and you get to a new equilibrium that nobody would have preferred. Like if you were to just start and say, how many nuclear weapons do you think you need your country to be safe? In 1945, no one would have come up with the answer. Uh, oh, let me just take some, uh, 60,000, that's the number. <laughs> yeah, it's, well, it's, it's terrible that, that that's, the, that's the idea. And, and it, it creates just, again, this whole different, this different dynamic uh, entirely. So we have SALT 1 and SALT 2. In the 70s, uh, different presidents, Nixon and Carter. Uh, at that point, what was, you know, we have, you know, uh, a good, you know, 10 or so years past um, the Cuban Missile Crisis, et cetera. I guess during the early 70s and all throughout the 70s, where we have these treaties, what was the kind of uh, global um, temperature for nuclear weapons at the time throughout the 70s for these treaties to be had? Yeah, so you had a lot of tensions between the United States and the Soviet Union, but you also have this period of relative detente, and there's this view that we have enough nuclear weapons to deter the other side. The, the major arms buildup had halted at that point, and there was a sense, how can we manage these arsenals, start to reduce these numbers, and work together on this shared challenge, right? And that starts to change, uh, especially after the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. Um, and that convinces, yeah, that, that convinces many people in the, in the U S that this is a country that can't really be trusted and that we need to embark on a new arms buildup. That arms buildup actually starts during the Carter administration. And, you know, he proposes a 5% per year increase in the Defense Department budget. And then when Reagan is elected, he takes that 5% and adds another 7.5% to it. So mm. massive arms buildup, which is really threatening to the, the, the Soviet Union. Um, so you have this new period of, you know, elevated risk and, and arms buildup after a period of relative detente. Mm. Does that make mm. sense? Yeah, yeah, it makes it makes a lot of sense. I guess there's this interesting thing of like again, it it really is an arms race, right? It, well, if this country has yeah. more, then then we're going to have more, and we don't want to be yeah. uh, exposed, or we don't want to be seen as you know defenseless or things like that. Yeah, we we have this period throughout the '80s where I mean, many people remember the, kind of the Cold War thing. And um, what what can you tell us about Start One and Two? Um, so different, uh, different, um, agreements, um, what yeah. was significant about both of those? I mean, I think that, that we could talk about the details, but it's probably not important. The most important part about these treaties is that they reflect a, a view that these weapons are a shared, they're a shared threat mm. and that we can start to work together. To, to limit them, and we can count the delivery systems, and we can start to phase out some of the outdated weapons, and in fact, some of the weapons that pose a, a greater risk. So there was mm. uh, an attempt to eliminate um, MIRVed warheads, for example. So that's one missile could have three or four or 10 warheads on it, mm -hmm. which would, you know, that's inherently destabilizing because yeah. um, you can, with a single missile, take out 10 of your opponent's missiles in principle, which mm -hmm. creates an incentive to strike first. So mm -hmm. part of these, these treaties are about reducing the number of weapons, but doing so in such a way that maintains stability, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and 
you know, they they require a certain level of trust because no arms control treaty is going to be perfect. Uh, the verification measures are never 100%. Hmm. Yeah. Um, but, you know, both countries had reached a point at which they had enough weapons that it seemed uh, impossible for the other side to gain an advantage by striking first. Hmm. But the interesting thing is that even, you know, that understanding is somewhat fragile. Hmm. So we learned later that during the 1980s, the Soviets were actually afraid that the U.S. was going to execute a nuclear first strike. Hmm. Um, and that this Reagan arms buildup was really intended to give the U.S. nuclear primacy to be able to strike first. And uh, there was a lot of concern among the Soviets that they were vulnerable to an attack of this type. So they were really closely monitoring what was happening in the U.S. They were uh, keeping, there was this thing called uh, Project Ryan, where they were gathering data from all aspects of society. You know, how much, you know, what is the level of uh, blood at U.S. blood banks? How many, how many cars are parked in the Pentagon overnight? Uh, things like things like that as indicators that maybe the U.S. was about to strike a preemptive launch. You have to remember the Reagan rhetoric at that time in terms of you know, the, the rhetoric of an evil empire and the types of weapons that were being built were pretty threatening to the, the Soviet Union. Uh, when Reagan le later heard about these concerns, he was like, are you crazy? Of course we weren't going to do that. Why did you think we were going to do that? Um, and that was like a, a wake up call, I think, because it's, you know, once again, you have this theme that the things that we do that make sense to us, mm -hmm. to the other side, seem really, um, un in some ways, inexplicable and, and threatening. Mm, yeah. So let's move to current day, I guess. So it's yeah. a bit of a kind of a, a, a march through history there, but which is all important. But so, so tell us, so let me see if I got this right. Currently, the way I understand it is nine yeah. countries have yeah. nuclear weapons, uh, yep. which would be uh, India, US, Russia, Israel, North Korea, France, Pakistan, China, and the United Kingdom. And you get North Korea on that list? Yep. 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 I had North Korea there. Was it always these nine? Did more countries have uh, nuclear weapons? Why do these nine currently have nuclear weapons? Are there potential for other countries to have nuclear weapons? What's where are we at kind of yeah. with where countries are now? It's a surprising list. So if you go like it we'll is. go back to 1945, the bomb is just uh -huh. dropped. If you were to say, okay, 80 years later, these are the nine countries that are going to have nuclear weapons. So you'd be right. like scratching your head. Right, because mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. at that time, there basically every advanced industrialized nation was exploring nuclear weapons and trying to mm -hmm. see is this a technology that we need, right? And so you would be surprised that countries like Germany didn't have nuclear weapons. Countries like Japan and South Korea didn't have nuclear weapons. Um, mm -hmm. You would be surprised that relatively small and poor countries like North Korea or Pakistan had nuclear weapons, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and that story is not a simple one and it's not monocausal, <laughs> right? But I'll try to <laughs> lay it out as, as best as I understand it, right? Yeah, yeah. Which is that you have these, these interlocking factors, right? Why do, why do countries pursue nuclear weapons? Well, the main reason is because they are concerned about their security. And so you have the, this alliance system, uh, NATO and the Warsaw Pact, where the U.S. leans on its allies, Soviet Union leans on, leans on its allies, and gets them to give up their nuclear weapons programs. Uh, so you see a lot of nuclear weapons programs in the 50s and 60s start to go away. But their, their countries are still hedging a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. um, the second piece of it is international law and building this non-proliferation regime, which starts off really weak, right? The, new, the IAEA is founded in 1953, but it really has no nuclear safeguards mission to speak of until later. 1968, you have the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Uh, which is an agreement that countries sign on to. But again, these are aspirational rather than binding. 
But over time, this set of agreements actually becomes meaningful. And countries sign on to say, we won't get nuclear weapons. In return, we will get the benefits of nuclear energy. The powers that have nuclear weapons will work to cease the arms race and eventually give up their nuclear weapons. And so in the 1960s and 70s, you see another wave of countries giving up their nuclear weapons, right? Hmm. Some countries don't, and they are either attacked or sanctioned. Um, and so there is military counterproliferation that takes out some of these nuclear programs, um, you know, most notably in Iraq, um, m- most recently in Syria, right? Mm-hmm. But that's not, a, that's not the biggest part of the puzzle. I think one of the biggest parts of this story is actually the evolution of norms around nuclear mm-hmm. weapon possession. And a lot of countries that could acquire nuclear weapons decide that they don't want to do that because they see these weapons as being uh, inherently inhumane and not in accord with their national character. And if they are able to acquire their security by other means, why would they rely upon nuclear weapons? So uh, an example of this would be like Japan or Germany. Yeah, exactly. They could do it, but they choose not to. Exactly. And Mm. both of those countries had um, relatively advanced programs. Japan still has uh, a hedge capability. It has Mm -hmm. uh, enriched and separated plutonium on its soil that could be used uh, to build a nuclear bomb. And they certainly have the um, advanced military technology to to do that and to deliver the bomb if they wanted to. But they have become a nation opposed to nuclear weapons in many Mm. ways. Um, part of that stems from their historical experience. But mm-hmm. once, once, especially democratically elected leaders, once they um, sign on to a set of laws and agreements, it becomes pretty hard for their successors to, to, to roll that back. Mm-hmm. And so you now have a situation where the vast majority of the countries in the world have signed on to an agreement to say they won't get nuclear weapons. And many have also signed on to an additional treaty the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, saying that they believe nuclear weapons are illegitimate and there should be no nuclear weapons in the world at all. Mm-hmm. Um, so they, that's the, 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 the type of norm formation that, that has happened. Uh, some people refer to it as this nuclear taboo, the taboo mm-hmm. against the use of nuclear weapons or the taboo against the possession of nuclear weapons. So... Let me just clarify something. Yeah. The the nine countries currently, yeah, they have the capability of making nuclear weapons. That's not to say that they they're not getting weapons shipped to them. They all have nuclear have. weapons um, in various various levels of readiness, right? Mm, okay. And you have you know the the U.S. and Russia between them have about ten thousand nuclear weapons. Fifteen hundred fifty of those are you know, operational, ready, deployed, many mm. of them ready to be used at a moment's notice. But then mm. you have other countries um, like the UK and France that have their weapons on submarines or missiles or on bombers. Um, and you have countries like North Korea, right? We don't know exactly the operational state of their readiness, but they have those weapons ready to be used. Mm. Um, and then in the background, so you have these nine countries that actually have deployed weapons ready to be used in various states of readiness. But you have another 30 or so countries that could develop nuclear weapons over some time span. So they have some level of a latent nuclear weapons capability if they decided to pursue that, right? Did you say 30 countries? Like between 20 and 30, depending on how closely you define latency, right? Double digits for sure. For sure, yeah. That is terrifying. That's terrifying. And I think that people don't appreciate that and they don't appreciate how successful the system has been to limit us to only nine because, you know, the, the technical and the engineering challenge, this is an 80 year old technology, right? Like what other 80 year old technology has not spread virtually Mm -hmm. anywhere. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's not that, you know, Germany, it's not that Germany doesn't have nuclear weapons because they can't acquire them. It's because yeah. they've, they've decided that the NATO nuclear weapons are sufficient to provide for their security. Um, and there is a sentiment among 
much of the German public that said, even if we could have nuclear weapons, we don't want them because this is not consistent with our national character. So let me ask, for for example, we, we can talk about Russia, Ukraine in a minute, and we can talk yeah. about Israel in a minute. I'm a little interested in, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I'm curious for your opinion yeah. here is, Kind of for each of these, North Korea seems, you know, a threat because of their rhetoric, but they're pretty isolated in a lot of other ways. Um, but how hot is this India Pakistan? You have, you know, I mean, India is yeah. basically the largest country in the world with China, but India and Pakistan don't always like each other. Yeah. And they both border each other and right. they both have nuclear weapons. Like, that's tense. It's like, tense. that's really tense. That'd be like if Canada and U S right. didn't always like yeah. each other and, and they yeah. both got nukes ready to go. Yeah. How the geography, I, we, don't, we tiny, don't talk about right? that a lot. So there's, like, yeah, yeah, there's yeah. a real risk that, you know, you talk about the compression of time. That's mm -hmm. one of the things that the U S was so concerned about when missiles arrived in Cuba. Well, guess mm -hmm. what? With India, Pakistan, like that situation times 10. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, and these uh, yeah, there's a lot of nationalism on both sides uh -huh, and, uh -huh. uh, you know, fervor. Now, India's nuclear modernization is primarily driven by their desire to be a big player on the international scene. They want the prestige. And they also are thinking ahead to, to China. They have had disputes with China in the past. They don't want to be bullied there, right? Um, but then you have this triangle because India is upgrading its military and its nuclear capabilities because of China. Uh, Pakistan sees that. They fear that nuclear uh, in India's improvements are going to threaten their, the survivability of their arsenal. So then they build up their arsenal. Um, and so you have this, and you know, there have been several skirmishes. You know, you actually, you had an Indian missile that went off target and landed in Pakistan not long ago. Right, so you have the potential for these, this error, this human error, this mm -hmm. technical error. Right, Pakistan relies heavily on these non-state actors that are not mm -hmm. affiliated with the Pakistan state, but are not entirely unaffiliated either. Right, you can imagine some of these groups going into India and launching an attack or a raid, and India responds with conventional force. If Pakistan starts losing a conventional war against India, mm -hmm. it will be tempted to use nuclear weapons to halt that. Um, and we know that while these arsenals are smaller, they're not small and could result in you know, millions, tens of millions of immediate deaths, but then cascading consequences from the environmental consequences from radiation, et cetera. So that's a situation that I'm pretty concerned about, you know, I don't follow South Asia as closely as I should. You can't keep your eye on everything. Right. But, mm -hmm. um, there, you know, there's a lot of powder in that keg. Mm. So I want to ask about new, uh, countries coming to play. I mean, I think, yeah. so we can use the example here of one of them, it, it, you know, you're talking about the norms of people saying like, look, yeah. we don't want to do this nuclear taboo. Fine. That's a good thing. Yeah, but there is potential, though. You were saying there's a, I mean, a good you know, double digits of countries that have the capability, and probably some more likely than others to start uh, making nuclear weapons. Yeah. So the case of Iran yeah. is particularly hot for yeah. a lot of reasons. So I, I, when I was preparing for this, I, I really wanted to ask you. Yeah. I really want you to explain to me and to listeners. What was Obama's kind of yeah. vision, right? I remember that whole nice speech he gave, you yeah. know, I'll, I'll open my hand if they unclench their fist or whatever it was. Very nice. Yeah. And he tried, I mean, he got a lot of shit for it. Yeah. I mean, people came after him on the Republican side and even other people globally. And he really tried. I mean, he yeah. really tried. They had the, um, I'm forgetting what the, the name of the deal was. Uh, Joint the Comprehensive deal. Plan of Action. Yeah, JCPOA. You're and, excused and then Trump, for, uh, for getting the name of this wonky. I, I, I can't remember. I can't remember all the all the acronyms. Are we all Too many acronyms in this field. I can't remember. Yeah. I can't remember. All. Yeah. So like we had this deal. Could, just tell us what the mindset was. What yeah. was there? And I'm assuming that it was 
it was very real that they were building nuclear weapons. Like they were a 10th yeah. country essentially. Yeah. And he did not want that because they had, I think Ahmadinejad at the time had said, we want to wipe Israel off the face mm-hmm. of the earth. And if they're building nukes and like, that's just a mess. Yeah. So, but then Trump pulls out of it yeah. and I don't know what the, I think Biden has said he wants to re-enter it. And so I know he said John he Kerry wanted to re-enter it, it, but then he didn't. And then things got worse. Yeah. And so, so yeah. give us this case example, I guess, of yeah. Iran. Tell us this story here with Iran and nu- nuclear weapons. Yeah. So this is an example of how hard non-proliferation can be, right? Because Iran starts a nuclear hedging program. Um, this goes back decades, back to when they were an ally of the United States, right? Mm-hmm. And they're exploring nuclear energy, but they're also exploring nuclear weapons. And a lot of countries do that, right? Mm-hmm. Um, they want to have the potential to, for, for both capabilities in case either becomes important. Mm-hmm. Um, they are discovered to being, uh, you know, they're messing around with some sensitive technology. And, um, you know, there are parts of the nuclear fuel cycle that are relatively safe and innocuous, and there are others that aren't. And the areas that are of greatest concern are uh, uranium enrichment and plutonium reprocessing. And Iran is developing a uranium enrichment program, which is way out of proportion with its domestic energy needs. Mm. Um, And you can take that enrichment plant and you can use it to build, to make nuclear fuel rods, or if you enrich the uranium further, you get a bomb, right? Mm. So they were on the path to have a nuclear weapons capability. They were also messing around with plutonium and some weapons designs, right? And so the, you know, the intelligence community recognizes that Iran is on, on its way. Now, remember, this is the same intelligence community that just a few years earlier thought that Iraq had a nuclear weapons program mm-hmm. and was a total debacle when after the invasion they realized what a lot of people knew, which was Iraq didn't have a nuclear weapons program or that they had ceased that program years earlier, right? Um, so Obama has a choice now. If he does nothing, Iran will acquire a nuclear weapon or at least the capability to build a nuclear weapon in a very brief period of time. Mm-hmm. Now, he could invade Iraq or launch airstrikes, but doing that, in the wake of the Iraq war, which he has been one of the most vocal critics of, uh, you know, you could see the quagmire we were already in in Iraq. So that doesn't seem like a good option. So they try to buy some time. They, they use working with Israel. They have this cyber attack. Uh, you may have heard the Stuxnet, right? Um, which to this day they don't acknowledge is a U.S. program, but everybody kind of knows it is, right? So. Um, <laughs> That was an attack on the Iranian centrifuge. It's one of the most sophisticated pieces of software ever designed because wow. it forced these centrifuges to go out of control, but in a way that was difficult to recognize that they were under attack. They just looked like a technical error, mm. right? Um, so that buys a little bit of time, but ultimately it sort of strengthens Iran's resolve. Uh, and now there's all these domestic political factors as well, right? Mm. So you have a choice. Um, you can either use military action, or you can try to strike a deal. And that's what they did. You know, Iran had invested a lot financially and politically to get to where they were and had made all kinds of justifications for why they needed this uh, nuclear program as a point of national pride and sovereignty, right? So they weren't going to just trade it away for nothing. So they established this deal, which in principle allows Iran to have a civilian nuclear program under very close and careful monitoring from the International Atomic Energy Agency. It's the most stringent form of verification ever ever imposed on a country, right? But in return, they're able to continue to run their centrifuges and some of the restrictions on centrifuges sunset over time. The idea being that they, they would be enmeshed in the system of international law and international commerce. It would create a cooling off period and allow for relations to normalize between the U.S. and Iran. And for a variety of reasons, that doesn't happen, right? And you know, depending on which, what your ideological bent is, you'll blame it on Obama, you'll blame it on Trump, you'll blame it on Biden, right? Um, 
Yeah, there are certainly domestic politics at play in Iran as well, which I think you need to take a look at. Um, but, uh, you know, you have a regime that's doing lots of questionable things and supporting terrorist organizations and is being sanctioned for their activities outside of the nuclear space. There are a lot of people in the U.S. who are saying, this is the same regime. We can't relax sanctions because they're doing all this other bad stuff, right? Mm. And then some folks in the U.S., especially in the Obama administration, said, no, the biggest problem they pose is on nuclear weapons. Yeah, we don't want them to do this other stuff, and we have ways to deal with that. But we need to, we need to keep our eyes on the ball. The biggest threat that Iran poses is if they cross that threshold and become a nuclear weapon state. So the deal was designed to solve that particular problem, not every problem that Iran poses. The Trump administration comes to office. They say, what is this, what is this crappy deal? We're, you know, we're letting Iran off the hook. Um, they're doing all this mischief in the Middle East. We need a, we need a program of maximum pressure. Uh, they pull out of the deal. This, of course, lets Iran off the hook. So then they can increase their uranium enrichment activities. And that's exactly what they do in order to gain more leverage so that they could then negotiate those away. So where we are now, basically, the deal is moribund. Iran continues to creep closer and closer um, to, to having a bomb or having a bomb's worth of fissile material. Um, the stringent restrictions negotiated through the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action are not in effect. And recently, the Director General of the IAEA said that he is not being provided adequate access to be able to make their determinations that Iran's program is peaceful. So it's a, it's a cluster. That's, 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 that's a big headache. I mean, you can really hear the pragmatism of Obama. Yeah. I mean, he's a very yeah. pragmatic guy yeah. and you can hear it. Um, yeah, that, that's, yeah. that's a mess. I mean, for me, it drives home this, this idea, which is that if a country is really set on acquiring a nuclear weapon, there's mm. very little you can do to stop them. Uh, short of invading, if you have that capability, right? Mm. Um, you can apply pressure, but if they are willing to suffer that pressure, uh, they will eventually succeed. And we saw that with North Korea. Uh, mm. You saw that also with Pakistan, which suffered under various sanctions uh, mm. in order to acquire a nuclear weapon that they thought was essential to the survival of their state. There's a, there's, there's a great quote by the Pakistani prime minister that said, we will eat leaves and grass if we have to, but we will not be left without a nuclear weapon in the face of India's program, mm. right? Mm. Um, so if someone's willing to eat leaves and grass, there's not so much you can do. So yeah. you need to think more broadly about how can we allow states to feel secure so that they don't mm. need to resort to developing nuclear weapons. How do you do that? Well, one thing, you don't threaten to topple their regimes, right? right because right, right, right. if they feel like the only reason that they can survive, the only way for them to survive in the world is to do what North Korea did and get nuclear weapons, then you will have a new wave of proliferation. But you also need to keep this non-proliferation regime in place so that countries that go this route find it much more costly. They have to suffer the financial costs. They have to suffer the reputational costs. So it's a really, this international non-proliferation system is really, uh, it's kind of ad hoc, it's kind of crappy, but the, the results so far for 80 years have been pretty decent, right? And you have all these countries that could have developed nuclear weapons, but they didn't do it. And so you have, like, it's pretty, um, pretty good record overall, but it's all fragile. It's all really fragile. Uh it's at the very least it's fragile i, yeah. I feel more <laughs> worried and concerned than yeah. i did before this conversation <laughs> so tell, yeah, I'm, tell not, us. I'm not helpful in that regard <laughs> so just i want to just make a footnote here um it, it might be a long footnote but just 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 i yeah. guess framing it that way when people talk about it's been more in vogue to talk about uh, I think on both sides here in the U.S., Republican, Democrat, of nuclear energy. Yeah. Um, and 
I think nuclear energy is fine, but my first thought is Chernobyl. Mm -hmm. That's my first thought. And I'm worried about playing around too much with nuclear energy uh, or anything nuclear, um, both on the trust end of things, both on, you know, human error and mistakes. Am, am I am I too worried about this? Should we? No, it's fine. We make nuclear energy. It'll be great for us. We don't have to use fossil fuels as much. It'll be great, whatever. whatever. Like, is this really the kind of like key that unlocks us mm-hmm. to say, okay, we use a little bit of clean energy, if you will. We use some of the old kind of energy and then nuclear energy. Yeah. What, what are your kind of just brief thoughts on the yeah. that end of it? So the reactors we're building now are so much safer than the reactors we were building in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, right? Like Chernobyl is an example of how to do nuclear wrong. It was <laughs> a, you know, a terrible design in a system yeah, that yeah. You know, covered up mistakes and yeah. was being run without any kind of containment vessel, right? Um, mm-hmm. you know, Fukushima was also, there were technical mistakes there, and they hit a you know, once-in-a-generation storm that uh, you know, took out the power supply and forced failure, right? Mm-hmm. So there, there are ways that nuclear power plants can fail. The plants we're building today are passively safe in such a way that even if you lost power, even in the worst case scenario, you're unlikely to have a radioactive re- release. And, you know, even in the case of Fukushima, the number of deaths from Fukushima, uh, you know, it's there's obviously disputed, right? Like people say the radiation is really bad. Other people say not. Even if you take the worst, the highest possible estimate for environmental and human harm from Fukushima, it's a tiny fraction of the number of people who die each year from the pollution from greenhouse gases, right? From air pollution uh, or from coal mining and, you know, those deaths, right? So, On one hand, nuclear is this really technically and scientifically sweet technology, right? Mm. It's like the amount of energy locked in a small piece of uranium is just so massive in proportion to any other technology on Earth. And, you know, you think we should be able to figure this out and to be able to harness this safely and cheaply, but very few countries have succeeded in doing that. And so the problem has been why, more. Why? Yeah. This is, a, this is a real debated question. And I think part of it is just mismanagement by some of the companies that are building nuclear power plants. But part of it, too, is you know, the layers and layers of regulation and red tape that we've heaped on to the nuclear industry. And a lot of it, it was, is with good reason, it's with concerns about safety. And the you know, the, the fact that there have been accidents at Three Mile Island, at Chernobyl, at Fukushima, hasn't given the public enough trust in this technology. There are new, re, you know, the current reactor designs, as I said, are much safer than those designs, right? But most people are not going to make that distinction. And of course, as you make the design safer, it becomes more expensive. So nuclear had its moment, right? Right now, solar and wind are the cheapest way to produce energy, and they're getting cheaper and cheaper each year. Natural gas is a really cheap way to produce electricity. And so nuclear has to not only compete against public perceptions, it's got to compete with these other sources of energy that are low carbon or no carbon and are cheaper, right? Mm. So the nuclear industry is going to need to innovate if they're going to uh, match these other technologies in terms of price and in terms of public trust. But mm. it's in, just this incredibly promising technology, right? So like the, the entire, the, the, the amount of waste for one individual to live their entire life powered by nuclear energy would fit in a soda can, right? Um, you know, compared to like, you know, buckets and, you know, piles and piles of coal mm. ash, right? Mm. So, yeah. um, I hope we can figure it out. (laughs) 
I'm, it's just, it's, I'm, I'm surprised more people haven't been able to do it or, or aren't yeah. doing it. Or, uh, it's very interesting. Okay, France produces 80% of their energy from nuclear, and they've done mm-hmm. so safely. G- Germany was, but yeah. then they, sh- they shut down some they of it. They shut it down uh, in uh-huh. you know, public concern after Fukushima. And uh-huh. so as a result, this country that's led the world in clean energy is mm-hmm. now buying a lot of their fuel from coal-powered electricity from other countries. Mm. Um, so there was a real cost to shutting down those nuclear plants. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping that a new wave of technology will mm. find a way to do nuclear cheaper and safer than it currently is, mm. um, and to be able to basically manufacture nuclear power plants rather than mm. build them as these enormous bespoke construction projects, which has been you know, the, the big problem with building more plants. So let's, let's go, I guess, to very current, uh, what's going on now in the world. Uh, I typically don't like to date my, my conversations, you know, <laughs> but I think, uh, regardless of when people listen to it, there will definitely be, uh, this unfortunately time in history where we remember yeah. these conflicts. So Russia and Ukraine are, uh, what has it been, a year and a half? I guess yeah. they're coming on two years now, right? Yeah. Almost two years, in November, unfortunately. In February, I think, yeah. Yeah. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, you know, that, um, you know, Israel and, and Palestine has uh, just absolutely horrific uh, images coming out from, from, yeah. from that region. Uh, recently, Israel has nuclear weapons. Russia has nuclear weapons. Ukraine does not, and Palestine does not. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you can take it in any order, I guess, maybe with yeah. Russia. What is the likelihood? I'm not asking you to be Nostradamus here. <laughs> so is there, a, is, I mean, no one knows the mind of Putin, all yeah. that stuff, but is there a space where, you know, he, he says, you know what? I'm tired of wasting all this energy and money and resources and manpower, you know, nuke right into Kiev. I mean, does that happen? Does, is there a world where that's literally possible or is this just, you know, grandstanding? It and- seems unlikely to me, but you never want to rule it out, especially when it comes to Vladimir Putin, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, is there a world in which he poisons the prominent opposition figure in his country? Like he did that. Is there a world in which he invades Ukraine in a, like this incredibly ill-advised gamble? Like he's known to take mm-hmm. these risks, and he surrounded himself with a small cadre of advisors, and it's not clear how much information he's taking in from that, that sort of conflicts with his worldview. So I don't see a... Uh, specific use of nuclear weapons by Russia that would advance their interests in Ukraine? It, would it would it harm them if they did use it? No, I'm not talking so. politically or but so. like actual physically. Not for, physically. You know, no, the the radiation you know, would not flow back into into Russia. The types, you know, the way that they would use it would not. So, it, I think, I mean, it's an interesting question. Why haven't they used nuclear weapons? Right? Mm-hmm. They have all mm-hmm. these weapons, including mm-hmm. roughly a thousand tactical nuclear weapons that they could be used. And I think they're deterred for a couple of reasons. One, they're concerned about what the response from NATO would be and from Ukraine. Mm -hmm. But I think more importantly, they're deterred by what the international blowback would be because we've established this tradition of non-use for the past 78 years. And for them to cross that line uh, is something that as I've heard that both China and India have told Putin not to go ahead with any nuclear attacks. Mm. Uh, he relies on those countries to continue this war. Um, they would become a pariah state in many ways. Mm. I mean, you, who knows exactly what would happen, right? But I think that's, that would be the concern. It's like, mm. would we become a pariah state? Mm. Because... Uh, roughly three quarters of the world's population lives in states that hasn't taken a side in this conflict, right? It's not favoring either Ukraine in the West or, or Russia. They're sort of sitting on the fence, right? Mm. So 
Does Russia want to risk that? Uh, quite aside from the narrow military objectives they might achieve, there would be massive costs that they would incur. But I wouldn't put it past him, especially if things start to go badly for Russia. Mm-hmm. If they start to feel desperate, like they're going to lose this war, that they're going to be humiliated, that he might be removed from power, that they're going to lose Crimea, um, you could imagine the conversation happening in the Kremlin. Could we use a nuclear weapon? Could we use a few nuclear weapons to push pause on this conflict and wake everyone up to the fact that we are a nuclear power and we're not going to go down like this? Um, so that's my concern. Um, yeah. And my other concern yeah. is, you know, maybe he draws a line in the sand. He draws a red line that then gets crossed. And maybe it's intentional or maybe it's unintentional, like the local um, surface to air missile operator who shot down a plane during the Cuban Missile Crisis, right? Maybe that line is crossed even without official authorization. And then Putin uh, feels like he needs, in order to maintain face, he needs to follow through on his promise. Mm-hmm. So um, he's made threats, but he's been pretty cautious in how he makes that threats, mm-hmm. how he makes those threats, unlike some of his proxies, like Medvedev, who's mm-hmm. sort of slinging wild rhetoric left and right. But mm-hmm. Um, the, the risk is there. And I think it reminds us that even though this is a conventional war, it's being fought in the nuclear shadow, these weapons haven't gone away. And so long as they're still there, there's a risk that they will be used. Mm. If, if, you know, uh, I hope that it doesn't come to that, but you're saying that if that did happen, you would basically have, you know, the international communities, specifically NATO, that would just unashamedly just basically attack Russia at that point. I mean, it would be, there would be, there would be no way where that just goes. I think the U S even though it's not formally allied with Ukraine would feel compelled to respond. Mm -hmm. And this is what the Biden administration has said is that, um, there would be dire consequences for Russia. I forget the exact language they used, Mm -hmm, but, mm -hmm. um, I don't think it would be nuclear. I think that Mm -hmm. they would probably strike some really important military sites in Russia or in the Black Sea. Mm-hmm. Um, but nobody knows and yeah. nobody's going to tell. So Yeah, I certainly don't want to find out. Yeah. I don't want that. Yeah. <laughs> now, turning to Israel, is that a, kind of the same concept or is that a little different? It's different. Uh, different, yeah. different priorities, different interests, different, a lot of difference. Yeah. What's the kind of story there? So Israel acquired nuclear weapons in the 1960s, but hasn't announced that they are a nuclear power. They maintain this uh, mm. position of ambiguity, saying they won't be the, the first or the last to introduce nuclear weapons to the region. Right? <laughs> um, but they have nuclear weapons, and they, it has not bought them the level of security that I think they would have hoped for. Right, it hasn't resolved their, you know, the, the people in Israel are not secure. Um, so it, I think it signals the limits of influence you can get with nuclear weapons. Um, similar to the, you know, the challenges that Russia is facing in using its nuclear weapons to get its way in Ukraine. There are limits to what you can do. Um, you know, I think that the Israeli people see this as the you know, their, their final resort, right? Like the, the, they call it sometimes the Samson option. They could bring down the house if ever they are invaded. And so it may help them in that regard. But, you know, uh, you know, as we've seen in the news, they have a lot of other immediate threats to security and Mm -hmm. it's small arms, it's light weapons, it's insurgency, it's terrorism. These are the things that are most likely to, uh, you know, to be the, the big security concerns. Again, very troubling because the air, the region has, you know, a, a lot of, um, uh, hot players. I mean, there's, yeah. a, there's a lot, there's a lot going on in the region and, and, you know, uh, you know, obviously we want, we want peace. We don't want people to be killing each other. It's awful. But when people have in the region, nuclear weapons, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's very, uh, concerning because of how the impact it could have for, you know, neighboring countries and things like yeah. that. I mean, it's, it's and I would say that nuclear Israel's nuclear program, 
It's one of the reasons that Iran wants nuclear weapons. It's right. one of the reasons that Saddam Hussein wanted nuclear mm-hmm. weapons. Like he specifically stated that. Yeah. Um, and other countries in the region, like like Egypt, mm-hmm. um, you know, there there is a proliferation problem right now in the Middle East, and it's being driven by Iran. But they are responding in part to Israel, mm-hmm. um, and you know, Saudi Arabia has uh, suggested that they want all aspects of the nuclear fuel cycle, which would allow mm-hmm. them to have a hedge capability as well. Mm-hmm. So. Um, that's the problem with these weapons is they give the illusion of security, but they're likely to inspire actions by your neighbors and adversaries that make you, when all is said and done, less secure. Somebody we haven't talked about is China. We're going to talk yeah. about it a lot. What's, what, what's the play there? I mean, yeah. is, is, are they ramping up their nuclear you know, kind of stockpile? Are they... China seems to me, just again, just from a yeah. pure observation, they don't like getting involved with stuff. They they mm-hmm. kind of like to just be like, look, we're cool, but we're not going to get involved formally or whatever. And what what do you, they have nuclear weapons. I mean, what is their kind of play? They're just kind of watching stuff and just letting it all go? Or is yeah. there a space where China does get a little more hands-on involved? Yeah, so they developed nuclear weapons in the 1960s and they saw them as a weapon of last resort. And a lot of their nuclear doctrine for the past 50 years was very much rooted in this Maoist view that nuclear weapons are paper tigers, that we won't be threatened and coerced by the larger nuclear arsenals of the Soviet Union and the United States. We believe it's enough to have a few nuclear weapons that we could use to destroy your cities. And that will inflict enough pain and punishment that you would never mess with our vital interests, right? Mm. So for many years, China had a very small and recessed nuclear arsenal. And then you know, around 10 years ago or so, maybe earlier, that started to change. And they are now building the sort of nuclear arsenal that the United States and the Soviet Union had. So these large active arsenals um, with advanced command and control, multiple platforms to be able to deliver these weapons. They've gone already from around 200 weapons to 350 weapons, and the Pentagon estimates that they're going towards 1,000 or 1,500 nuclear weapons within the next 15 years. So they are ramping up their production very quickly, and I think Part of it is just a change in strategic culture. Part of it is uh, Xi Jinping, whose desire is to have a larger role for China in the world and in the Western Pacific to try to resolve the Taiwan issue. And to be able to do that, they want to be uh, to have a nuclear arsenal that is similar to that of the United States and Russia, um, so that they can't be coerced and bullied. And I think a big part of that comes down to this sense that they had um, in the 2000s that they were vulnerable. And that if the US used nuclear weapons first against them, or even used conventional weapons first against them, that they might not be able to retaliate. And this was also driven when the US pulled out of the anti ballistic missile treaty in 2002 to build much more sophisticated missile defenses. All of a sudden, China had to think, does this make us vulnerable to coercion um, by, the, by the United States? And you know, maybe they don't have a lot of interceptors now. Maybe their interceptors aren't that good right now, but we know they're spending a lot of money on it. Why would they be doing that unless they have a desire to try to neutralize our deterrent? So uh, I think that that was a big turning point in Chinese nuclear strategy. But it also ties into a broader sense of, of nationalism and mm-hmm. wanting to you know, be able to assert what they believe to be their rightful place in the 21st century. Mm. Well, it's, just, it's you know, when, you see, when you look at the, the region there, you have the issues with Taiwan. Obviously, you have they're allied with North Korea. India is not that far away. You know, again, Pakistan, it's all... <laughs> It's all in everybody's backyard. It's, yeah. it's just not, it's not good. It's just yeah. not good. And it's kind of remarkable. We haven't had a 
nuclear war or even a war directly between nuclear armed states mm. for the past 78 years. That's a really good and I think surprising outcome um, given the number of close calls we have, given the number of players involved, right? Mm. But yeah. I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't bank on that lasting indefinitely um, because it just takes one slip. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it really is wild how things can just, you know, kind of ignite that kind of match. And then it's, you know, it's, it's, it's really, it's really, it's really uh, troublesome to, to consider. I guess about the U S side of things, yeah. are we, we're not testing uh, we're not. weapons at we're not. Do you think? Do you think that will happen? Will we'll resume testing? So the soon? U.S., from what I've heard, does there are lots of scientists and technicians in the U.S. who would like to test uh, in order to be sure of the viability of the nuclear arsenals. So mm. based on simulations uh, and estimations, we believe the arsenal to be very reliable and secure, and certainly a lot of money is spent on that. Um, but over time, you wonder, uh, are these things really going to perform as they were designed to perform? Some of these weapons are 50 years old, 60 years old, right? So I think some people in the US nuclear enterprise would like to test, but they don't want to be the first to test. Mm. And so I think some people would welcome a Russian nuclear test. Uh, we see activity now around Russian test sites. We hear them talking about maybe they need to test. Um, so I think some people in the U.S. would welcome that. But I think the, the, the position of the Biden administration and others is that we don't need to test. We have safe, secure, and reliable weapons for the foreseeable future. We want to work towards a world of fewer nuclear weapons. And if we test, we allow China and Russia to then test. And, you know, you, you don't you need testing for two reasons. One is to ensure the viability that the weapons will still work. But also, testing allows you to develop new designs, mm. and to, or at least to test out the new designs that you may have already created. Um, and that allows for maybe low-yield nuclear weapons or nuclear weapons with specialized effects. And I think there's some evidence that Russia and China would like to be able to do that, but they mm. ha would have a hard time doing that without additional testing. So once the test there's been a moratorium on testing. The only country that's tested in recent history is North Korea. Mm -hmm. um, but that opens up this whole Pandora's box, right? Because you have this comprehensive test ban treaty that has been signed, but it hasn't been ratified by all the parties. It hasn't entered into force. It's not legally binding. And if that agreement unravels, that's another one of those impediments to countries getting nuclear weapons or improving their nuclear arsenals. Um, it's better if that stays in place, right? Mm. If they if they do, where do they usually test? They still do it out in you know Nevada. And yeah, Mexico they do it underground now. I mean, the U.S. hasn't done a test in decades, right? But mm -hmm. if they were to test, they would test underground in mm. remote locations. Well, and what about these hypersonic strategic missiles? Yeah, um, maybe describe what they are. Yeah. It's kind of maybe more new tech and. We haven't a similar question. We haven't, I don't think we've deployed a system with them or maybe we have, but kind of just tell us what they are and what were yeah. our stances. on. So that. there's a variety of, when you say hypersonics, that encompasses a variety of different weapon systems, right? And, you know, they, the definition I believe is moving five times the speed of sound or faster, but then our ballistic missiles actually move 20 times the speed of sound. So they're much faster than hypersonic weapons. So what's distinctive about the hypersonic weapons is not their speed, but it's a combination of speed and maneuverability and the types of platforms they can be put on. Um, so you know, the US, Russia, and China all have hypersonic programs. I think that the actual impact of these systems is pretty overhyped, to be honest. Right? It's, they can be detected, they can be shot down, they're not invincible. They, there are some specific advantages from hypersonic weapons that you can attack from different, uh, from different angles, um, but it's really hard to design something that can move really, really fast and be really, really maneuverable. Mm. Right? Um, so 
I'm not, I don't think the presence or absence of hypersonic weapons really changes much in terms of the broad strategic landscape, but mm-hmm. they're, they're an excuse that all countries will use as to why they need more money to develop more systems um, to counter what's going on in other countries. Mm-hmm. So we're likely to spend a lot of money on these things, even if they have um, questionable um, marginal benefits. Now, I haven't asked this question, but it's going to be connected to uh, uh, another question, so I've kind of saved it. Can you, if, if, if you're able to describe it, what if, some, if, if, if President Biden says, we want to use a nuclear bomb on this location, in this country, on this site, for whatever, right? Whatever reason. Let's say it's a retaliatory, whatever. Yeah. Currently, what's that process? Does he just say, give me, give me the, the football or whatever it is, and here, put in the codes, and I push the button, and then boom, it's off? Or how, how, what's the process of actually deploying or giving the okay? Like, what's that kind yeah. of process so of doing that? We have, in the US, we have systems in place to try to ensure that only an authenticated order from the commander in chief could lead to nuclear use. And in practice, the president has a set of codes. They're kept on his person at all times, right? It's called the biscuit. It's like a little capsule with a piece of paper in it, right? And those are the authorization codes. So if they, if there were a decision, if there were a crisis that required the president to contemplate using nuclear weapons, uh, presumably he or she would call a crisis conference and would bring together key advisors, right? And they would present the information, they would present the war plan, and then the president would be the sole decider as to whether nuclear weapons were used and which of the war plans was enacted, right? And then once the president made that decision, they would read that authorization code off of the biscuit, and that would be transmitted to the strategic command and then out to the operators who would set in motion that plan. Um, To this day, there is no legal check and balance on the president's authority to use nuclear weapons. And this goes back to the Truman administration Mm -hmm. where Truman, uh, after, after Nagasaki, you know, he, he basically said, don't use any more of these weapons without my explicit authorization. Um, so it was in effect to try to take control back from the military, right? But it has led to this state of affairs where there really is one decider and they have almost king-like authority in this one realm, right? Whereas every other thing in our system is built on this set of checks and balances, right? When it comes to nuclear use, there's still one decider. Yeah, so this literally is just how it's always been since the bomb was created, essentially, is the one person decide. Like, we're literally, that is one person's decision. Sure, yeah. advice, whatever, whatever. But everyone could tell him, like, no, don't do it. He's like, you know what? I heard your advice. I'm still going to do it. Like, it's, it's, there's no committee. There's no, there's no committee. There's no ethics board. <laughs> there's no, no. I there's mean, no, it's interesting that you say there's no ethics board because, Um, under the uniformed law of armed conflict and embedded in U.S. military practices, um, there is a requirement to refuse an illegal order, right? So the, the commanders receiving a presidential order, if they deemed it to be illegal, they Mm. could refuse that order. Um, and this was a point that was raised by General Hyten when he was the head of strategic command, and people were talking about President Trump potentially using nuclear mm-hmm. weapons in an unhinged way. And he mm-hmm. said it would be our responsibility to refuse an illegal order. But in practice, all of those war plans that are pre-vetted, there is some legal review of those war plans before they become formalized, mm-hmm. but they've all been approved as legal. So at what point would a, 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 under what, mm-hmm. under what statute would the commander of STRATCOM say, no, Mr. President, this order mm-hmm. is illegal if they're executing a plan that has already been predetermined to conform with the uniform law of armed conflict? 
I mean, that's just a lot of power for one person. Yeah. yeah. Uh, again, we've, it, it doesn't seem like we've been in that situation as of yet. So hopefully we're not, but I mean, we, in the, there was a crisis in the 1970s with Nixon where, um, he was drunk all the time and yeah, right. And, right. And, and, Some, know, someone has an accident like or they're, yeah, too and, many drinks or right. <laughs> uh, Kissinger and Schlesinger apparently reported, you know, re- reportedly said like, um, if the president gives an order, come to me first to actually make sure, which was not legal. Let's be clear. Like that's yeah. not a authority that the national security advisor or the secretary of defense had, right? This was, um, someone just trying to exert a common sense check and balance on a system where there is no legal common sense check and balance. And there's currently legislation out there that to try to get the rules changed so that the president doesn't have the sole authority in this way. Uh, it, it makes sense to me. I mean, there are scenarios you can imagine where mm-hmm. you're under extreme time pressure and duress. And yeah, maybe you need this person to make a decision to, to respond in the heat right. of the moment. Right. But that's a very specific scenario mm-hmm. and for other mm-hmm. scenarios. If, you know, God forbid the president ever thinks about using nuclear weapons first, they shouldn't be able to just do that. Mm. They should have to get approval from someone, right? Like, yeah. what, we live in a democracy here. Mm-hmm. In principle, well, I mean, there's there's the opposite end of that, which is you yeah. know you don't want you know a kind of you know a Doctor Strange love kind of situation where everyone's right. just getting around a you know just yeah. you know going on and on and on about what, what are we going to do and what should we do right. and I mean there's pros and cons to this obviously, but yes, it does seem like too <laughs> too too much in one person's pocket to just be like, you know what? And, and right. Take, taking him like, yeah. uh, you know, president Trump, if someone is a little unhinged or they just, you know, wake mm-hmm. up one day and they fire a tweet off and they're just like, you know mm-hmm. what? You know, that, that, yeah, <laughs> there's, I mean, there's, issues you know, if, there's issues. If the that. election goes as expected, we're going to have an 80 something year old president, You're one right. of two, um, one of whom has shown, um, a penchant for really provocative statements and actions. Um, right. And the other has a, his own history of gaffes, right? Right. So, right. Um, do we want to entrust the power to end the world in one individual? Um, you know, it, it, it seems unwise. Yeah, yeah. I say so end the qu- world. I'm being a little flippant there, right? But we're talking about no, no. But I know. I get what you're saying. I mean, it could be catastrophic for sure. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. Th- so my question with this is this again thing that everyone's talking about is this notion of AI, right? Yeah. So even if a human being gives the order, pushes the button right. or whatever. If there was AI that was doing all of the work before that, right. Right. Where we're cutting this in half, you know, for, you know, doing this whole command control and we have all these things automated yeah. or the machine learning gets really yeah. good where humans aren't even doing it. They're just kind of being like, okay, this all checks out. Okay. Boom. Go ahead. Let's just go. Is that another concern of like, well, what what kinds of machine learning or, or types of AI systems are doing this that for something so uh, potentially catastrophic, if it goes wrong or if the numbers yeah. aren't right or something yeah. like that? I mean, what's the risk of this world that we're entering as well? Well, I think it's inevitable that some form of what we call AI is integrated into nuclear operations, either in the, you know, the stage of advising the president and to figure out like what's going on in the world. Like we have all this signals information that's got to be processed somehow. And you can call it AI or you can call it software, right? But mm-hmm. there mm-hmm. is some way that you've got to take all of this data and make sense of it to make a decision in real time about whether you are under attack or not under attack, right? And now we know there's a long history of close calls where right. Our systems misled us, right? The famous one is 1983, Stanislav Petrov, this operator in the Soviet system saw a false alert. He didn't pass up the order to, you know, to that this was a, a legitimate attack and we avoided nuclear war because of that, right? But there are other instances too. The US has had false alarms in 1979, et cetera. And in each case, there was a person who looked at the data and said, this doesn't make sense, right? I think we will always want to keep a human in the loop, right? Mm. But what does that actually mean in practice, right? right? right. If, if you 
have no ability to really question the information you're getting, you don't actually have agency. Mm-hmm. Um, and a good example of this is like with, a, with Tesla, with these full self-driving cars, yeah. right? Yeah. So yeah, you're supposed to always be monitoring the vehicle and keeping an eye on the, the road and the monitor, but over time people become careless and they, right. you know, the system has made a left turn successfully a hundred times in a row, they get complacent and all of a sudden they hit a truck or they hit a person who's walking their bike across the street because the, the, the data is new to the system. It's complicated. The conditions are different, right? Um, I think the fundamental problem is not AI. The fundamental problem is that we have these nuclear weapons on high alert, and we are making extraordinarily high stakes decisions in a compressed time period. And whether you have a human making that decision or an algorithm making that decision, there is room for error. There's room for technical error. There's room for human error. There's room for miscalculation in a variety of ways. Mm-hmm. And as long as we keep relying on this system and rolling the dice, eventually it's going to fail, right? Mm-hmm. So my advice is, yeah, let's not turn over the nuclear codes to the AI systems, but right. also let's look more broadly at the system we've built. Mm-hmm. And it's a system that is driven by a need for speed. Do we need to move as fast? Can we be more contemplative? Can we be more certain about what's happening before we respond? I think in the U.S., the answer is definitively yes, that we have a very robust nuclear enterprise, including these nuclear-armed submarines that can lurk uh, invisibly off the coast and could deliver whatever retaliation conceivably is needed without being under extraordinary time pressure to use or lose those weapons, right? Mm -hmm. So we should now adapt our nuclear policies so that we're not prepared to act so quickly. And we should understand what are the pressures that we're creating for adversaries? Right, yeah. Yeah, like there's there's always a focus on how can we be sure that our weapons always fire when we want to and never fire when we don't want to. Mm -hmm. But- when you have a nuclear deterrent relationship, you're only as safe as the strongest chain in that link. Mm-hmm. And if we're doing things that pressure Russia and China and North Korea, and I guarantee you we are, right? Mm-hmm. That's, part of our nu- that's part of our nuclear operations like, and conventional operation, putting pressure on them, right? Mm-hmm. How much pressure do you want to apply to a nuclear armed adversary that might make a decision under imperfect information and under stress? Um, and destroy your nation. So we need to understand those state, we need to understand the stakes, but also the, the types of decision-making pressure that we're creating for others. Mm, Yeah. I I fully agree with all that. I think that's, those are absolutely uh, words of wisdom. So the last question I have for you is maybe just end us with talking about the work you do at Longview and how we're, you know, you're trying and, and folks over there are trying to help push for a healthy nuclear security non-proliferation, uh, all of these things, and, and what are, you know, what the the future can be or what, what is envisioned for a future yeah. uh, that's a healthy nuclear one. Yeah, so governments have always been in charge of these weapons, but these weapons affect all of us, right? It, it's really a matter not just for governments, but for citizens too. And there's a need for non-governmental expertise. And you can go back to the scientists who worked on the Manhattan Project and the political scientists of that era and the impact they had on shaping the way we think about these weapons to, you know, more recently in the 1980s, you had a movement of citizens who stood up and said, enough is enough. We don't need a new arms race here to yeah, more recently. Still, you have non-governmental groups that put forward interesting ideas that then became government policy. So one of them was the Nunn-Luger Cooperative Threat Reduction Program, which emerged out of academia and out of think tanks and ended up being taken up as a way to manage risk as the Soviet Union was collapsing and reduced proliferation risk, right? So a lot of good ideas have come out of non-governmental groups, a lot of political pressure. Um, you know, 
politicians respond to incentives, right? Um, and we also yes, need, do. <laughs> we need, we need new ideas. We need new approaches. So what we're trying to identify are what are some of the best opportunities to have civil society and expertise re-engage with this issue and not just leave it to defense contractors and to military bureaucracies and mm. to interest groups from U.S. allies who want to see a particular outcome, right? We need a more public interest focused voice in this conversation. And so we're looking at a variety of things. We're funding research, we're funding analysis, we're funding outreach, and we are trying to rebuild this community of practice, which unfortunately is tiny and has really shrunk. Because people forgot that nuclear weapons exist, forgot that they're a problem, and that has uh, flowed down to the world of philanthropy as well, right? So you think about the big problems facing humanity, right? You've got climate change, you've got nuclear weapons, you've got AI, biotechnology. There's a variety of things that are big problems that face, that, that face the planet, right? Um, right now, we're spending about a billion dollars per year on climate philanthropy. And that's important. It's tiny in the world of philanthropy, but it's really a lot of money that's going to good groups who are doing technical research, policy research, et cetera. In comparison to that $1 billion per year, there's about $30 million spent per year on nuclear philanthropy. This is a tiny community of practice. And a lot of these people are, 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 have deep expertise, a real passion and good connections and an ability to uh, really contribute good ideas. But they're, they're gasping for oxygen. There's just not enough funding in this space. Um, so that's what we're trying to rectify. With, with that, you were talking about how do you get the public involved? So it's not just for yeah. bureaucrats and military defense uh, uh, personnel. How do you kind of, kind of um, guard against this kind of notion that a lot of the times when they're seen as a problem, and a problem with really big consequences, catastrophic consequences, at least in the United States, I would say maybe in other countries as well, typically what tends to be the response publicly in terms of engagement or in terms of trying to do something is hysteria mm. or sensationalism. Yeah. How do you ward off against that and right. make it more tangible and pragmatic for having yeah. people involved? I mean, that's, that's my fear right now is that we are headed towards a new arms race. Um, as the New START Treaty expires, as China builds up its arsenal, there are a lot of people within the nuclear enterprise and the defense establishment that believe the U.S. needs a lot more nuclear weapons. Um, and it would not be all that expensive to mm. increase the nuclear arsenal compared to other things we're spending money on. You know, we're spending a ton of money on the nuclear arsenal right? Like a trillion dollars over the next 30 years. But the marginal increase to have twice as many weapons is not a, you know, it's not a big part of that. And so I think you could have people responding to these threats and to threat inflation, supporting um, much more hawkish policies and an expansion of nuclear weapons. And, you know, the goal might be to gain an advantage against Russia and China. And for a while, you might be able to do it, but unfortunately, these things have a way of finding an equilibrium. And in the end, we will be less safe because Russia is not going to stop. China is not going to stop if they feel vulnerable. Um, so but wouldn't the argument be yeah. that with all of the conflict we have in the world at the moment, it's like serious conflict, yeah. right? The, the, yeah. the war in Russia with Ukraine is, is a big yeah. deal. What's going on in Israel is a big deal. I'm pretty sure, I mean, what's going on in Syria, I think Yemen yeah. still has a conflict and war. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of stuff a lot going, going on. on. Yeah. Wouldn't These it These things be come in batches, right? We can't, we can't be saying, you know what, you know, Carl, this is nice, but right. no, we can't be downsizing. Right. right? That yeah. doesn't make sense right now. That was cool when Obama did it and we were trying yeah. to get out of Afghanistan, Iraq and stuff, but you know, we should be going the other way. We should be making yeah. more weapons. What, what do you right. kind of say to, to, to that? I think that's the argument we're going to hear again and again. And I think it's important to remind ourselves 
what the U.S. nuclear arsenal looks like. You know, it's 1,550 deployed weapons plus a hedge force, and these weapons are essentially, most of them are on submarines, they're uh, invulnerable, and each of those weapons is capable of destroying an entire city, right? So when someone tells you they need more weapons, for what? What is that going to buy you? Is it just in order to be able to say you have as many weapons as your adversary? There's such overkill already built into these arsenals. We have nuclear sufficiency, and maybe it's not time to be moving towards smaller nuclear arsenal in the time when our adversaries are ramping up, but there's no need to run that race because we know where it's going to end up. Uh, I guess one of the other things that you mentioned, and I'm just thinking about it, you said that new start expires. When does that expire? In February, 2026, but it's already on the ropes. Uh, yes, Russia has stopped sending their, their new start reporting. There are no on-site inspections. So uh, U.S. and Russia are both holding to those caps that are established in New Start. But as of 2026, that treaty will go away. It'll be the first time in something like 50 years that we don't have a binding arms control treaty between the U.S. and Russia. Well, I'm just thinking about <clears throat> who's going to be the United States president in 2026. That yeah. would be really important that it's somebody that is committed to nonproliferation. Um, yeah. And that's a worry. Um, yeah, when you select a president, there are lots of things the president can do. The president's given um, a lot of responsibility for things that they don't have much control over, like mm -hmm. the economy, right? Mm -hmm. But one right, area right. where we know that they actually <laughs> do have control is over certain aspects of defense policy and especially nuclear policy. So um, that's something everyone ought to consider when casting that vote. Yeah, absolutely. Well. You've been so generous with your time, Carl. I've, I've been thoroughly, um, I mean, more informed than I ever, ever thought I could be on this. And so I'm very yeah, grateful and I'm sure listeners will absolutely love this. Um, yeah. Obviously, uh, I can point people to, to Longview, uh, yeah, but where I, I any should, other places? I should mention, yeah, um, we have this Nuclear Weapons Policy Fund. And the goal of that is just to make it really easy for people to contribute to good organizations and good experts doing work in this space. Um, so we do all the due diligence and the investigations, and we just try to make it easy, like a one-stop shop. There are other, there are a lot of group, great groups operating in the space, uh, Nuclear Threat Initiative, the Plowshares Fund, the Arms Control Association, the Center for New American Security, or a few of them, Center for Strategic Risk, and lots of groups that are doing great work. Um, but we just wanna make it easy for people to, See, the, see where their money's going. Um, and I think we need to rebuild this space a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. So that's what, that's what we're trying to do. But um, I'm also happy to, to share with you um, some, uh, you know, some other videos, writing, thinking, if uh, your listeners are interested in learning more. Yeah, that's, 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 I think that's wonderful. More information from good sources is always, always welcome. Uh, Carl, this was so much fun. Yeah. Uh, I really did have uh, such a blast uh, just talking about these really important things. And it's something that I think is becoming, unfortunately, on people's minds. And so you've been super helpful kind of This is your, it's your idea of a good time? <laughs> yeah, well, it's a good time in terms of, of understanding the information. Yeah. But uh, yeah. I'll be yeah. honest, I'm a little bit more depressed yeah. afterwards. Yeah. Oh, my gosh, there's all these things. But we need people like you trying to you know point people in the right direction. Uh, that are that are handling these things. So, um, real appreciative of all the work yeah, you do. And thank and, you uh, too. Um, really yeah, appreciate the opportunity.